Welcome, friends, um, to the Sanctuary Global Debate. Uh, this is something that we've been doing. The Sanctuary Nature Foundation has been organizing these debates for the last six to eight years. This is the first time we're going out to an audience such as this. Um, I would like uh, just one thing to be understood. This country, we've seen debates which are not debates. They're slugfests. This is a debate I hope that when, we, when, you, when you hear everybody today, you'll find that it is possible for us to disagree without being agreeable. And that's the heart of it all. Besides which, quite honestly, if your arguments are good, you don't have to shout. And we have, <laughs> we have the wonderful Mr. Amitabh Kant over here, uh, who, will, who will be the, the, the chair of the house. And if any one of us gets out of line, you can be sure he will tell us. So may we start by uh, requesting um, uh, Julia Martin Lefebvre, an independent advisor on sustainability who was director general of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, between 2007 and 2015. Her considerable experience has helped shape environmental and economic policies across the world. She is currently on the board of several institutions that address issues of vital importance to the future of our planet. Julia, may I request you to share your thoughts and your opening remarks? Thank you very much, Vitu, and good evening to you in Delhi and good afternoon from Paris, where we're now in full lockdown again. So. In the environmental science world that I come from, I have to confess that we rarely use economic terms. I, therefore, I had to remind myself what a wholly owned subsidiary means, especially in the context of the environment or nature, the subject of our debate. So if the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, we will see which side of the house believes that the world's economy depends 100% on the well being of its parent company, the environment. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, on whose bureau I, I sit, uh, published a global assessment last year, which I think most of you have seen. It's the first global assessment, assessment on, on biodiversity. And the news, just like the several other global assessments on climate change, was not good. In most major land habitats around the globe, native plant and animal life has fallen drastically, mainly over the last century. And with human population passing 7 billion, human activities are altering the, culture, the natural world in an unprecedented rate. All this combined with climate change and now the COVID-19 pandemic seems to have pushed us to the urgent need to agree on a concerted way forward so this debate is really timely. The IBEST report on biodiversity and pandemics released just yesterday tells us that the risk of pandemics is increasing rapidly with more than five new diseases emerging in people every year and any one of which has the potential to spread and become contagious. The report also reminds us that almost all pandemics of the modern era are caused by zoonosis or germs that spread from animals to people. And tells us, the report tells us that the underlying causes of pandemics are the same global environmental changes that drive biodiversity loss and climate change issues, which unfortunately have mostly been treated separately. That's I think the only, only opinion I'm, I'm um, saying in this brief uh, in these brief remarks so the uh, biodiversity and pandemics report prepared and reviewed by a large group of scientists from all parts of the globe identifies the human behavior causes for such pandemics including land use change deforestation urbanization agricultural intensification and wildlife trade and consumption it does not end up with a hopeless message but rather calls for a one health approach focusing on prevention and offers strong economic incentives for transformative change to reduce the risk of pandemics. This year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day. The poster for that event, which you may recall, is now famous with its simple message, we have met the enemy and it is us. If that is the case, can we stop being the enemy and learn to value that parent company, nature, and its life support services? 
A recent study in France tells us that whatever differences exist between people, the protection of the environment seems to be a commonly shared value. I think this may well be the case in many other countries. I trust that this debate will give the answer from both sides on how the environment can be the parent company the world needs. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to hearing the arguments. Thank you so much, Julia. That was wonderful. Uh, I would like uh, Aditya Agarwal, who heads Morningstar, and uh, to, to, uh, he, he has very kindly been the gentleman who has sponsored uh, our event today. Uh, would you like to say words, please, uh, Aditya? Thanks, Vito. <clears throat> uh, so at uh, we, we are really delighted that we are part of this. Um, at Morningstar, we are really committed to building a sustainable future for the communities we serve. We are excited. We have been associated with Bitu Segal and Sanctuary Asia on several other initiatives, and are delighted that we are presenting uh, this global, uh, the Sanctuary Global Debate 2020. Globally, environmental, social, and governance factors are becoming commonplace when constructing portfolios, and we expect this trend to flow through to India as well. Our research validates that investors do not compromise on returns when they apply their ESG lens while constructing their portfolios. Sustainable investing, however, is yet to gain traction in India, and events such as these, the Sanctuary Global Debate, would help spread awareness and understanding on this very important subject. We deeply value and embrace diverse thoughts as it inspires ideas and provides multidimensional perspectives all of which are critical to serve our mission of empowering investor success. With that, I would like to invite Mr. Amitabh Khan, CEO of Niti Aayog, to chair the debate and start the proceedings. Over to you, uh, Mr. Khan. Thank you. Uh, the Sanctuary Global Debate 2020 now begins. The proposition is the House believes that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. Let me quickly familiarize you with the debate rules. Speakers, please keep your cameras on at all times. Mute yourselves at all times and unmute only while speaking. I repeat that. Mute yourself at all times and unmute only while speaking. All speakers will have four minutes to deliver their opening statements. Three minutes for the rebuttal round and then two minutes to conclude. So four minutes, then three minutes for the rebuttal round and two minutes to conclude. Speaking for the motion are Dr. Maria Nera, Professor Navrosh Dubash and Pawan Sukhdev. Dr. Maria Nera has been working for the World Health Organization since 1993 and currently serves as director of the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health. She was previously the Vice Minister of Health and Consumer Affairs for Government of Spain. Navroz Dubash is a professor at the Center for Policy Research and has been engaged in global climate debates for over 25 years. He was instrumental in establishing the Climate Action Network in 1990 and has authored a report for the now iconic Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC. Pavan Sukhdev is the founder CEO of Sustainability Analytics from G GIST Impact and has served on the boards of NGOs such as Conservation International, the Global Reporting Initiative, and the Stockholm Resilience Center. He is currently the president of WWF International. Speaking against the motion are Dr. Jyotsna Puri, Priyanka Chaturvedi, and Rohit Bansal. Dr. Jyotsna Puri leads the Independent Evaluation Office at the Green Climate Fund. She has authored a paper in Global Handbook of Impact Investing and was recognized by the Global Landscape Forum as one of the women leading the work on restoring the earth. Priyanka Chaturvedi is a member of parliament serving in Rajya Sabha. 
She has been a columnist for Tehelka, DNA and First Post, and is extremely well known for promoting education, women empowerment and health. Rohit Bansal is the group head of communications at Reliance Industries and a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. He serves on the national executive of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry and co-chairs the e-commerce committee. Dr. Maria Neera has sent us a recorded statement to open the debate as she's in a major WHO meeting right now. She will join us in person for the rebuttal and the concluding rounds. At the end of four minutes for everyone, I will have a, a bell like this at the end of four minutes and subsequently for three minutes and two minutes. So we will start with Dr. Maria Nira for the motion. Excellencies, dear participants, panelists, greetings from Geneva, from the World Health Organization. We are living exceptional times and uh, we all need to take decisions based on the evidence, based on our society needs and based on our economic recovery and protecting the health of the people at the same time. Clearly, debates like the one we are having today are very helpful. We need to have a very strong debate, intellectual debates, where we can obtain the best of knowledge and then being able to take the wise and strategic decisions that will benefit our society. At the World Health Organization, we are putting, of course, at front human health, but we are very conscious that the decisions we are taking to protect human health will have enormous consequences and impact on the economy, on a country and a society. That's why normally all the interventions we are proposing are those that, while protecting human health, will have at the same time enormous economic benefits for the population at the same time as we protect or we create the healthier possible environment for the population. Let me start with a figure that is really of maximum concern for all of us. Every year there are globally 7 million premature deaths caused by exposure to air pollution. We have even new scientific studies adding science here and, and, and knowledge telling us that more you are exposed to air pollution, more you will be vulnerable to infectious agents uh, of uh, respiratory origin like uh, the, the, the COVID-19. Therefore, we decided to push for making sure that now that big investments, big uh, stimulus packages by governments will be dedicated to the recovery of the COVID-19. We thought that uh, we should provide some advice on how to ensure this recovery at the same time that, that we ensure the best of our protection for human health. Believe me, environmental health, human health and animal health are very, very much linked. Biodiversity, the protection of our ecosystems, the way we interact with, uh, with nature will, will determine enormously our health, but in, in addition to that, our economy. In fact, we see that those countries that are exposed to air pollution, because they are still relying on fossil fuels uh, as a source of energy, they are putting at risk not only the health of the people, paying enormous uh, bills for, for the, the, the chronic diseases resulting from this exposure to the combustion of uh, fossil fuels, but at the same time, they are investing on an economy that is not sustainable and, and is creating not the basis for a good and healthy recovery, but at the contrary, putting the basis for creating even more disease, uh, creating cities that are impossible to live in, and creating the, 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 the perfect conditions and determinants for non-communicable diseases, and at the end, destroying the economy. While those countries who have invested on renewable sources of energy, on clean sources of energy, those countries are seeing a, a, a very good protection of human health, a reduction in the prevalence of the diseases, and at the same time, a fantastic economic uh, 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 development. 
we don't uh, buy anymore this argument that if you want to have a good economic development, you need to destroy the environment, and by destroying the environment, destroying human health. Human health is very much linked to environmental risk factors. In India, we all know that, uh, unfortunately, the, the fact that um, air pollution is still very much present in, in most of the, the cities in India, this is causing a, an incredible burden for people's health and obviously putting barriers to the economic development. Our first prescription under WHO's manifesto for a healthy and green recovery tells us that first we need to recover our relationship with nature. We need to make sure that we stop destroying nature, which is the source of our health. After all, the, the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat are coming from nature. So we better recover that relationship with nature because we need it. It's, it's, it's a question of protecting our health, not only protecting the environment and the planet, it's protecting our lungs, protecting our health. But another important prescription is the number three, we need to quickly move to uh, renewable sources of energy, clean sources of energy, stop using coal and fossil fuels because that will put at risk our health. I'm sure that India will be a champion on taking very ambitious decisions on looking at the medium and long term and investing on something that will give the perfect situation and even acting as a champion in giving the rest of the world good ideas and all this uh, healthy energy transition. Governments are spending $400 million every year to pay subsidies to fossil fuels. This is generating a bill of $5 trillion on paying the health consequences, the negative health consequences of those investments. Come on, I think it would be fantastic to rethink the way we invest we can do everything, protecting the environment, protecting biodiversity, creating a good economy, and, and, and protecting our health. We are convinced that this circular approach can be done, and that will be on benefit of everyone, and particularly on the benefit of our citizens that are the ones for which we are working. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have uh, Dr. Jyotsna Puri. May I request you to speak against the motion? Uh, Joe Puri against the motion, four minutes. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, really a, quite a privilege for me to be here. When I decided to speak at this session here today, many of my friends and colleagues expressed surprise that I was going to be speaking against the motion. Because as you may know, and as the audience may know, I've worked in the area of climate change and environment for the past 25 years. So it's a subject that's very close to my heart. But, uh, but unfortunately, today I'm speaking against the motion. And that's for another reason. It's for the reason that my foremost loyalty is to evidence. And what the evidence is showing to us today is that despite what our aspirations are, we are firmly on the side of economy and at a, at a stage of our development and progress, which is directly in conflict with that of the environment. So I am much like the keynote speaker today, going to parse the topic in front of us. And the way I've parsed it is when we say that the economy uh, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, we are essentially saying that the environment is controlling or has a controlling stake in the economy as well as in the markets that we are working with. And unfortunately, Chair, that's simply not true. So I have four things that I want to bring as messages today. The first one, I'm gonna say that um, it's money and the profit motive that is ruling our action and unfortunately not the environment. The second, that the government and the private sector and we the people together are just not doing enough. And in fact, our very actions are the ones that are perverse. Third, countries are pledging but are not delivering and there's an accountability gap. We are, and again, with due apologies to you, Chair, and to the rest of the organizers, we are, in the, in, um, in the words of what an American philosopher at Princeton University, uh, Harry Frankfurt, calls a bullshit world, and I'll explain why. And last but not least, action is required. Otherwise, what I'm saying is that the environment has today become an unwitting tool, which is used at the convenience of the economy rather than having control over it. 
The first statement that I made, Chair, money and the profit motive is basically what is ruling our action and not the environment. I've had the privilege of working and living the past 10 years in India, in South Korea, in Europe, etc. Um, and unfortunately, in each one of the countries, I have worked, biked, walked across long distances and across countrysides. And despite what we are seeing in terms of planetary boundaries, we've got enough research and enough evidence to say that yes, we are irretrievably uh, and irreversibly flouting almost every boundary with respect to the environment, with respect to nature and with respect to the planet. Despite all of that, we are irreversibly hurtling towards a development pathway which is doing nothing to assuage that at all. Despite COVID today, if you do a very quick search on the internet for the 10 largest companies in terms of market capitalization, I'm hoping that you won't be surprised if I tell you that their forecast profitability, which is what market capitalization is an indicator of, the, in the top 10 are China Petroleum and Chemical, Petro China, Royal Dutch, and two car companies. And this, despite the fact that we've been talking about getting onto development pathways that are sustainable and low fossil fuel rates. Last year, while we were all the world over was committing to lowering greenhouse gas emissions, Saudi Aramco was the highest valued company. That's one. And number two, where I said the government and the private sector and we the people are just not doing enough. Our actions are perverse. Just to finish, uh, Chair, what I'm saying, when we looked at um, companies that are doing environmental and social governance, what we're finding, and this is my research, but also my colleagues at Columbia University, where I also teach, we found that companies that are actually pretending to be high ESG are the ones that flout most of the environmental rules and get most of the subsidies from governments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Jyotsnapuri. Uh, may I now request uh, Pavan Sukhdev uh, to speak for the motion. Mr. Pavan Sukhdev, for the motion, four minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, it's my privilege to uh, be in this, in this group uh, debating an issue which is, of course, dear to everyone's hearts. But I'd like to begin by just uh, looking, again, passing the statement that was made, uh, a metaphor uh, which was made by Herman Daly, who said that uh, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. Uh, the same Dr. Herman Daly, who was actually chief economist of the World Bank, so not exactly a diet in the world environmentalist. And uh, the same man who explained his statement by saying that he was not trying to invent a new economy. He was not trying to invent new economics. He was basically trying to apply old economics to new scarcities. And the scarcities that he was referring to at that point were the scarcities of what we call ecosystem services, clean air, fresh water, nutrients, uh, the, the evapotranspiration that becomes rainfall that, feels the, uh, that uh, fuels the agricultural economy, of which India, of course, is a significant uh, part in this world. So he was referring to that scarcity. And in that, he was also pointing out what to all of us is, is obvious, which is that the things that make this economy, the goods that we, we uh, use and which are manufactured by our, our economy, in fact, come from nature. Of course, we may measure GDP as final value of goods and services, but we keep forgetting that there is an intermediate value as well, which we consistently fail to capture and fail to measure. And that is evident. The room that I'm in, everything here was either mined from this planet or it has been grown on the soils of this planet. So to me, the image of uh, the economy being a, a subsidiary of the environment actually holds, rings true. But I would, I would argue in favor of it for a different reason, which is that when we look at what part of the economy matters, and here I speak as an Indian, that clearly the part that matters is the GDP of the poor. It is not the GDP or the, or the incomes of the rich that we are trying to increase. We are trying to, uh, we are trying to reduce the poverty of the poor. And when we look at that, and by the way, this is not just a case in India, but a study was done about 10 years ago, the TEEP study, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, which looked at the fraction of household incomes of rural communities and forest dependent peoples, respectively 280 million people in India, 100 million in Indonesia, and about 20 million in Brazil in the Northeast. 
and found that respectively 47% on average, 75% on average, and 89% on average of the household incomes of these people depended on direct and indirect inputs from nature. After all, we know that if the forests recede, it is the nutrients and fresh water that flow to the fields of our poor farmers that are affected and their productivity suffers. We know that it is the poor farmer's wife, usually, who has to walk further to be able to gather the fuel wood because half of the country's homes still use fuel wood as their main source of cooking fuel. We know, therefore, that there is a direct impact on the flow of goods and services from nature into what I call the economy of the poor, the GDP of the poor. So the reality is that even though our general um, uh, GDP statistics don't seem to give enough credit to this invisible economics of nature, the reality is that, in fact, when we look at those for whom development is key, this is half, three-fourths, or even 90% of, the, of their household economy. That's the reality that we need to acknowledge. And there are other reasons why I would argue in favor of this motion, which is that, and my, my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Dabash, will, will touch upon this later, it is not just goods and services that is being provided by, by nature to, into the economy, but it's also stability, it's also resilience. We are testing the fag end of a, an epoch of 11,700 years known as the Holocene. And during this epoch, and only during this epoch, has there been a predictability of the seasons to such an extent that human beings are able to carry out agriculture? What would we be without that? That too is part of the, uh, what nature provides into the economy. So I'll pause here and, uh, and thank you, Chair, for, uh, for listening. Thank you, Mr. Pawan Sukhdev. Uh, Priyanka Chaturvedi, may I request you to speak against the motion? Ms. Priyanka Chaturvedi, against the motion, four minutes, please. Thank you so much, Chair, for giving me the chance to speak against the motion. As much as I'm a very, uh, uh, I would say, proactive environment lover, but at this point in time, I stand to disagree with this particular motion because I believe the basic premise of ownership is exclusionary in nature. I have my reasons why, which I shall elaborate later. But before that, I would want to step into history a bit. Part of the spark, I believe uh, our keynote speaker, Ms. Uh, Julia, had spoken about Earth Day. But we must remember, part of the spark that ignited the entire change began from Gaylord Nelson. And Gaylord Nelson was also the person who brought in this idea about economy being a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. While it has been uh, in motion since past 50 years where we celebrate Earth Day and we create environmental awareness, Many environmentalists today would tell you that they do not get excited about the fact because they believe that corporates have totally, totally taken over Earth Day. And what we see in garb of you know, being environment conscious is greenwashing of the profits that they seem to be making. The reason why I say it's exclusionary is because of exactly these reasons. Today, environmentalists believe not enough is being done and individuals have been made liable to save the environment while companies have been getting away with this. With this kind of a, a, a motion, what we end up doing is again creating more corporates to continue to make more profit out of the environment by greenwashing and using PR campaigns to serve that their purpose. What we will again end up doing is to create a bigger gap between the have and the have nots. And I would again want to bring in Gaylord Nelson's own words where he speaks about sustainable environment, sustainable development, which says our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty. The objective is an environment of decency, quality and mutual respect for all other human beings and all other living creatures. So the argument should be about coexistence. The argument should be about evidence as to how we can give this entire ownership rights to the environment, because we must remember our planet is a shared natural resource where we all coexist, where we all derive the fruits of the, uh, the planet on the basis of coexistence. So this is what uh, my particular argument on this uh, entire issue would be. But my uh, major argument on this would be, while it sounds very idealistic uh, when we speak about uh, respecting the environment by making it a wholly owned, uh, by making the economy a wholly owned subsidiary, what we're not understanding is that we are pushing some kind of an idealism approach, not the practical approach. The proof of the pudding is in its eating. And when we aspire for something, we should be able to understand the practicality of implementation. So that is why I believe that this particular idea, this particular uh, motion, is not 
something that will help the environment, but I believe it will only create a bigger divide between the haves and have nots and damage the environment as we see it today. I would like to conclude there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Navroj Dubash, it's your turn to speak for the motion. Navroj Dubash for the motion, four minutes, please. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I've uh, enjoyed listening to, to my colleagues, both for and against the motion. And, and what I want to focus on in my four minutes uh, is really the fact that we are in a remarkable moment uh, when it comes to how we think about the environment and the world of ideas uh, around the environment. And we are also in a remarkable moment in human history where we are grappling with an incredible pandemic uh, that actually makes uh, the task, I would argue, of those of us for the motion a lot easier to make. So let me, let me sort of explain that a little bit more. I think, I think uh, it was also mentioned uh, uh, by our first speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Maria. Um, so we are now at a time when a zoonotic disease, the COVID, the COVID uh, pandemic, has laid waste to economies and societies around the country. Uh, we are having this conference uh, by Zoom in part uh, for this reason. Uh, this is not an isolated case. 75% of new infectious diseases have been zoonotic uh, in the recent past. That is, they have leapt from uh, wildlife to humans. Uh, this has because, this is largely, as Julia Martin Lefebvre have said, because of destruction of habitat, because of changes in the environmental system, which in turn have been prompted by humanity's relationship with fossil fuels, cheap fossil fuels, that have allowed us to expand our scope, reach polluting activities, and put more and more stress uh, on the environment. So what have the costs of this been? We've seen the costs here in India, 23, 24% year on year decline in, in, in the last quarter in our economics, migrant labor uh, across the economy. So we have a direct story in front of us of how the environment is a necessary underlying basis. A stable environment is a necessary underlying basis for the economy, which is really what our proposition is all about, that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. And I will just note that actually what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues is not an argument against the proposition. They seem to be arguing against the idea. That they're asking whether people act as if the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. Uh, whereas actually the proposition is, is it in fact so? And I would say COVID gives us a really powerful case uh, for, for, uh, uh, in favor of this, uh, of this proposition. There's also an element of hubris that we see uh, uh, even to challenge this proposition in a sense. And, and this is, again, something that we can see uh, from, from COVID. You know, COVID has come to us from bats, right? And bats, in a sense, have used us as an amplifier, or the disease, rather, has used us as an amplifier uh, for their prevalence. Bats are a species that, uh, and this my uh, Depeche Dr. Burpee at the uh, University of uh, Chicago, who writes very elo eloquently about this, points this out to us. Bats are a species that are 50 million years old. Humans are 300,000 years old. We are part of a giant and historic dance, uh, a Darwinian dance. And that larger context is what shapes all of our activities, including things that on a historical scale seem kind of trivial, like whether or not we have growth in a particular quarter or not. These are much larger debates and a much larger canvas on which we are trying to write uh, a, a human history. So in that broader sense, uh, and uh, I would like to suggest that we think about this, that we operate in the world of ideas, embracing things like the idea of the Anthropocene. We have recently come to realize that humanity is making an impact on the planet at the level of geology. Uh, future generations, we'd be able to see humans impact at the level uh, of, of, of geology. Um, but we are doing so in ways that are largely uncontrollable. We don't have a good way of controlling what those impacts are. So I'll just conclude my opening point by making this, this statement. What we learned from COVID and what we will learn from climate change, about which I'll talk later, is the fundamental interconnectedness and the embeddedness of the human enterprise in the larger environmental arena. And that's what we need to unpack and understand. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Navroj Dubash. May I now turn to Mr. Rohit Bansal and request him to speak against the motion? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, uh, 
you are a distinguished economist. You read economics several years ahead of me in our alma mater. This is not to invoke any personal uh, uh, favoritism on your part, but to say that uh, are you any less an environmentalist? Uh, this debate, to my mind, is done to entertain. This debate is to divide us into a schism and then uh, basically to inform and then come together. So my submission is that uh, uh, there is no uh, real reason to distinguish between the economics and the environment, economists and environmentalists. Uh, even last year when I had the privilege of speaking and uh, we had hoped to have you over, Mr. Chairman, uh, the discussion was between biodiversity and economic security. And the House initially was rooting for economic security to the exclusion of biodiversity. But Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to report that when the, uh, the debate ended, uh, there was a question whether the, it needed, need be a debate at all, whether biodiversity and economic security need to be seen uh, in plurality or they should be seen as one. And likewise, Mr. Chairman, this year too, our organizers have uh, have done a fabulous job bringing together in this new format. And I report to you here from uh, the back and beyond of Konkan in uh, Guhagar in uh, Ratnagiri district, and which is why the lighting and other things. But the fact remains that the economy here remains absolutely intertwined with the environment. And there is no case to draw the artificiality of wholly owned subsidiary, partly owned for subsidiary, 51%, 74%, and all such things on, in which you, more than anyone else in this house, is most familiar with. Uh, now, but the fact remains that the way the proposition has been uh, has been uh, framed, it makes us, uh, Joe Puri, uh, Priyanka Chaturvedi, and myself, a bit like uh, Mahinder Amarnath and Madan Lal in 1983 in the World Cup when we are batting against, uh, uh, bowling against uh, Viv Richards, Clive Lloyd, and what have you. Uh, actually, the debate is a little specious. Uh, it's an artificial fight, as if to entertain, like I submitted, Mr. Chairman. And the debate uh, was settled uh, in, 19, uh, in 2015, when the SDGs, the 17 of them, were really brought out. Now, where would you put things like poverty and hunger, which governments across the world have actually settled down as the key issues that uh, among 17 have to be handled. Would you bucket them in the economy or would you bucket them uh, as a subsidiary of the environment? Actually, where would you put uh, antithetical positions that have long been settled, Mr. Chairman, on health, on gender, on water, on work and growth, industry, uh, life below water, life above water? What is the point in continuing to, to draw ourselves into an Oxford Union style debate when we actually need to have agreed upon a discussion and see where are the implementational gaps, Mr. Chairman? What can governments and citizens uh, come together on a project basis, on an execution basis, on the things that the governments and, the, and our people have long agreed? And I would say that it doesn't need four minutes plus three minutes plus two minutes to say these things. Uh, we are uh, being held hostage by a format. We should be actually looking much further. Economic starts with E. Environment starts with E. Uh, both are, it's, a, it's, a, it's, I think, a travesty of justice to be able to uh, draw one as subsidiary of the other. Um, while there are a lot of international audiences here, uh, I would still quote a little bit from uh, Urdu and come to a transliteration or translation. Uh, Tum ao. I will talk to my uh, my uh, my friends on the so-called other side. Tum ao, Gulshan Badosh, Lahore ki lekar. We are not India and Pakistan. Tum ao, Gulshan Badosh, Lahore ki lekar. Bring on Paris. Hum lai Roshni Banaras ki. Bring on the United Nations. Bring on Paris, bring on United Nations. Let's join forces, Mr. Chairman. The economy and the environment are one. One is not the wholly owned subsidiary of anyone else when you are actually conjoined. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rohit Bansal. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude this four minutes round. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, we begin, we begin the rebuttal round. Teams, the rebuttal round now begins. Each speaker has exactly three minutes for the rebuttal. May I now request uh, 
Dr. Jyotsna Puri. Uh, it's your turn against the motion, three minutes. Thank you, Chair. And I also want to thank my colleagues for a very rich uh, conversation till now. I, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a somewhat um, non-traditional space in this overall conversation, because I do think that it's time, the walrus has said, for us to start thinking about the second generation of questions, right? Um, I, I think that there is a larger question that is in front of us today that we are refusing to accept. And like the Alcoholics Anonymous will tell you, the first step to change starts with acceptance. And what I'm asking and exhorting all of you to do is to accept the fact that much as we aspire, and I think we all speak, I'm speaking for everyone here. If someone could mute their phones, please. But I'm speaking for everyone here that yes, we would like the economy to be, to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. I think we are all, we, that's aspirational. But what we are seeing is that there is the policy agenda as well as the action agenda of not just countries, the international community, as well as national governments and subnational governments are irretrievably on a path that are wildly divergent from what we'd like to see. So what I'm asking all of us to do is to first accept that that is true. Second, to recognize that there are forces and policies that are still out there that are hugely exploitative that are taking us away and to recognize which ones they are, and then to start thinking about tools that we might employ to redress this. So, you know, a lot of you use the example of Earth Day. That by itself is an example to me of what is how we treat the environment as being really marginal. When you have marginal things in the world, you create days for them. You don't have economy days. Yeah, these are because the economy is dominant in our lives. You don't have men days, you have women's days, right? Because they are marginal and they need to be brought into the fold of our decision-making. And that's not happening. So let's recognize and accept that we want to make a change in the overall fabric of our decision-making. Currently, yes, of course, all of the inputs around my apartment as well, sitting here in Amsterdam, come from the environment, but so does labor. So does capital, so do many other things. The thing is, many of these things are not priced. Pavan knows this more than anyone else around here, that, uh, that we don't price many of the things that come to us freely. And unless you price them, you can't manage them. And unless you don't price them, you're not going to give them a controlling stake in your decision-making framework. So you first, you've got to start pricing them. Second, you've got to start redefining the GDP. The GDP is a really cool tool, but believe you me, that we are, and again, to repeat the earlier phrase that I had, we are living in a bullshit world because we are unable to verify the extent to which we are promising and pledging all of these commitments with respect to the environment, with respect to climate, with respect to biodiversity, we are pledging them. And policymakers around the world know that yes, pledges are useful, but they also know that verification is super hard. And it's when verification does not occur, we are able to make all these pledges, but we don't realize them. Till we, are, we thought we would be on a 1.5 degree pathway. We are now on a three degree pathway with respect to temperature rise, right? With respect to climate change. And this is going to continue. Last point, last point, with respect to subsidies, all of the countries, the G20 has provision that yes, they will make commitments and realize their Paris commitments. The G20 countries are the top subsidizers of fossil fuel energy today. And I can give you numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Puri. Uh, may I now move to Pavan Sukhdev, uh, rebuttal for the motion, three minutes. Well, it's, uh, it's with regret that I have to rebut such fine arguments from uh, people who've clearly thought through uh, the issues at hand and fundamentally don't really uh, disagree with the nature of the problem. Um, but when Joe says that, you know, she would like it to be that the economy is a subsidiary of the environment, or, or when Priyanka speaks about I quote, the environment of mutual respect that's needed for proponents of both. In fact, what they are saying, as I see it, is an acknowledgement that we are not, we are heading in a collision course. Uh, there are 10 planetary boundaries and we are heading towards deep collision on the climate side and on the biodiversity side. 
and the zoonoses of the last 20, 20 years, and there have been four major uh, viruses that have hit us. This is the fourth one. These are examples of that collision course. So whilst uh, it may appear that the world of nature is not exercising control, the reality is that we are still technically and legally, as for the, uh, the Commission on Stratigraphy, Stratigraphy, we are still in the Holocene. And in fact, that's a complex adaptive system. And that complex adaptive system is sending us signals through what we call feedback loops. The negative feedback loop that we have experienced just now, which we are still going through, which has completely shattered our economy, indicating again who has the real power. That negative feedback loop is coronavirus. And I'm sorry to say this, and I don't want this to happen, but there will be more such negative feedback loops. So we can achieve that, that uh, balance of uh, mutual respect, the environment of mutual respect that you referred to, Priyanka. And, and indeed, we can achieve also a more gentle recognition of the reality that we are part of the ecosystem and then therefore part of nature. I mean, humanity as a society is part of nature. The economy is just the transactions that we conduct amongst ourselves, which are priced. And by the way, there are lots of transactions we conduct, as Joe rightly reminds me, which are not priced. I mean, the work of mothers and, and, and house uh, uh, homemakers, or, or indeed the, the, the commitment of children to their parents or of parents to their children. We spend a lot of time and a lot of energy in numerous commitments which are not priced and not part of the economy. So the economy is a subset of us, humanity, and then humanity is a subset of nature. That's the way that I would like to express it. So in some ways, of course, maybe I'm saying that it's a subsidiary of a subsidiary of the environment. Um, and finally, I'll say this, that the uh, problem with the greenwash, which both of you have pointed out, yes, I, I note that problem, and indeed there is an increasing gap. But isn't it exactly because of the economic invisibility of nature, which governments are not correcting through adjusting GDP to recognize the trillions of dollars which are there in intermediate goods and services and there in terms of the resilience that they provide the, the, uh, the uh, natural environment provides the, for us society and therefore for the economy. We are not valuing that resilience. We are not valuing those ecosystem services. And that's giving us the impression somehow that it is, to quote, to quote both of you, um, the, that money controls everything. It's not that money controls everything. Money thinks it controls everything. And look what nature is doing in response through a simple virus-based negative feedback loop. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pavan Sukhdev. Uh, I now turn to Priyanka Chaturvedi. Uh, it's your turn now. Priyanka Chaturvedi's rebuttal against the motion. Three minutes, please. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, i just like to make a few points, uh, which uh, Pavanji made, uh, and he has some very valid points, and I cannot, I find it difficult to disagree, but however, I would have to disagree because I have some uh, bigger points to make, and the point being when he says governments are not doing enough, that is where the acceptance of not doing enough comes in, which um, Dr. Jyotsnapuri spoke about. Once we accept, then we rectify, and I would I would be more than happy to share an example that Maharashtra government has got involved in and has been doing at the cost of making people realize that, yes, the environment stands supreme and economy can also coexist as part of the uh, environments that we live in. We had an example of RA forest. I'm sure most of us had heard it. There was a lot of activism around it. And we, uh, as soon as we came into power, our government came into place, we moved the RA car, we moved the metro car shed. The argument was over development of metro, creating infrastructure, building infrastructures versus saving the greens. We said we can do with both. We can save our greens. In fact, we can add to our greens and we can also have a metro. Only if we reroute it and we change how we, our mindset is. Our mindset has come to believe that we own everything that we see inside. Humans own this planet. Human owns own all the resources. But it is time for governments to realize and make people realize that we coexist. And this is what Maharashtra government is doing. So while economy is, uh, uh, while creating infrastructure is part of the economic process, when we had many people arguing that development at any cost uh, pro lobby was arguing about how infrastructure would suffer, how people would suffer. What we did not understand and what we made people realize is that environment and not having enough forest, not having enough green lung uh, or greenery around cities and urban spaces are going to do a bigger damage to our infrastructure and the city as we see it. Whether it was creating, uh, uh, you know, uh, objecting to Tadoba reserves, the coal auctions happening near Tadoba reserve, which we brought to a stop, this is where governments come in. When you have conscious governments, 
when you talk about sustainable development, when you talk about coexistence, and you make governments and you make the governments understand, our governments and make people understand that this is how the future is and what you are leaving back for generations to come, is when we create an environment of mutual respect, which I believe we are doing, and this is the way forward for, I would say, govern governance across the globe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we now have uh, uh, Professor Navroj Dubash uh, giving his uh, rebuttal for the motion. Uh, Professor Navroj Dubash for the motion. Three minutes, please. I enjoyed listening to, to, to all my, my colleagues, and I particularly appreciate the calls uh, from the other side to sort of come together in a sense in, in what, what seems to be a, a shared set of ideas. At the same time, I, I feel that we have to push. There are actually there is actually space here for us to probe some differences in a productive way. Um, I think I agree very much with Mr. Uh, Roy Bansal when he says, "Look, you know, the SDGs essentially exemplified an agreement that a whole range of things are important, right?" And I agree. So those 17 SDGs, poverty, energy, climate, et cetera, all important. But that doesn't really tell us how they're related and what it, what it means to make progress on one versus the other. Uh, and so I think that we have to go beyond agreeing that they're all important to understand how then we make progress. What are the trade-offs and synergies uh, uh, across these? There's a need for deeper analysis, uh, which is where I think our proposition comes in handy. I also agree with both uh, uh, Jyotsna Puri and uh, uh, Priyanka Chaturvedi when they say, look, we're not acting in a way, human society doesn't act in a way as if this proposition is important. Again, that's not what we're debating here, but they're right to say that, I agree with that. Uh, and when Jyotsna talks about the pr uh, prices of, of uh, uh, the asset values of various companies and fossil fuel companies still doing very well, what, we are, what that proves is that people are acting as if the economy is not a wholly owned subsidiary because they are acting on beliefs, but it doesn't tell you anything about the underlying conditions. That debate still has to be had. Is it in fact fair to be doing that? And I would argue that the declining asset values of coal companies like Peabody and the increasing uh, values of companies like Adani Green are suggesting those beliefs are changing that there's a growing recognition of, 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 of uh, uh, the relationship that I'm arguing in favor of. And similarly with, with uh, Priyanka Chaturvedi, I completely agree there's a lot of greenwash around concepts like uh, Earth Day and so on and so forth. But I would not actually argue, as both of you all do, that the best way forward is an acceptance of this reality. In fact, it's quite the contrary. I would say that we have to even more vociferously argue that a we want it all and we can have it all approach is actually going to work against both a recognition that the environment provides a basic sub substrate for the economy and that we in fact have some constraints if you want to maintain that substrate in a healthy state. So for example, uh, the fact that you know, if climate change persists, uh, the World Bank shows that 600 million odd Indians will find it harder and harder to actually have improved living standards. And some states like Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh may actually lose, uh, may actually have declining living standards. And similarly uh, with, with air pollution, I'll, I'll just conclude. So my, my point is, if we are going to basically get recognition that with a declining environment, the ground is tilting ever upwards if you want to increase living standards, that you don't actually want to accept a situation where you're actually swimming upstream, where you're climbing up a hill that is getting ever steeper. We can't just accept it. We actually have to argue for an understanding of this relationship, which is what the proposition uh, seeks to convey. Thank you. Um, thank you, Navroz. Uh, may I now request uh, Mr. Rohit Bansal to kindly give his rebuttal against the motion. Three minutes, please. A great sense of, uh, of gratitude to Professor Navro Dubash in particular, who has come half the way uh, from a debate to actually a discussion and from, you know, antithetical and artificially antithetical positions to actually the reason why mature heads like us have come together. 
So I, I must welcome uh, Mr. Dubash. I don't know which way the, the crowd, uh, the audiences are going to see, uh, but I would say Ahmed Faraz put it rather well. I am extending a, a warm a handshake to Professor Dubash and uh, certainly uh, Professor Mr. Sukhdev as well. Uh, it's not as if that we are excluding you, but you know, sometimes we get used to the uh, the format so much that we lose sight of uh, uh, the forests uh, in, in pursuit of the trees and brownie points and debating points. So uh, what uh, uh, Priyanka stated regarding uh, her governments, uh, and it's a, a minority government which is in a coalition mode, so they don't necessarily have the brute majority, but look at the good things the Indian democracy has been able to show. In the case of RA, she talked about the Chandrapur mines, and, and it is possible, therefore, to uh, you know get over this discussion between uh, subsidiaries and wholly owned subsidiaries, and therefore the, the, the environmentalists stacked totally against the economists. I think uh, while we are on Chandrapur and Maharashtra and the government that uh, my uh, colleague uh, Priyanka represents in the uh, upper house of Indian parliament, uh, we as a company uh, just did one thing. We went to the forest of Tadoba, we found that there were 800 people who had signed a petition and had said we would like a mobile tower. And there were some people who said that the moment you put a mobile tower inside a, a Tadoba Forest Reserve, poaching will increase and all kinds of disturbance will happen and so on and so forth, Mr. Chairman. But I'm happy to report that the seven villages who actually some of them didn't sign but put their thumb out there, uh, they are very happy. They have the signal. The kids are able to study in the process that uh, uh, we didn't have any anticipation of. Uh, the uh, doctors can be hailed if there is a problem and uh, people don't need two-way communication to be able to first go to Chandrapur, pick up a doctor on a bike and bring him or her to the, to the, to the village. Uh, they can actually come to from 0G to 4G in one quick surgical move. So the economy and the environment can coexist just as the trees and the forests and the tribesmen do not need to be treated as museum pieces and be left on their own, just so that the economy can, can, can possibly be divorced from them and them being the custodians of nature as we hope that they should be. Uh, it is very well uh, possible to see them uh, as fighting for economics, fighting for water security, environmental security in the same way. So thank you very much, Professor Dubash and uh, Pawan. Uh, I think you lost your partner somewhere. So uh, you are hamstrung a bit, but uh, that's what happens when uh, you have a very formidable batting lineup and when Madan Lal and Mohinder Ramarnath are bowling. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, very fascinating debate. But fortunately, the opening batsman is back here. Maria, may I request you to give your remarks in the rebuttal round? And uh, each speaker has been given was given three minutes for the rebuttal. So, Dr. Maria Nira, please. Thank you very much. I think, uh, as I say in my introductory remarks, uh, this type of debates are fundamental. If we are all on a very open mind and we are ready to 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 discuss and confront our ideas, but with a common mission. For me, the mission at the moment is to recover after this terrible uh, pandemic that we are all suffering. Today is the pandemic, but tomorrow there might be another crisis. It can be climate change that is waiting just to, to, to come in, or is already air pollution. And therefore, we need to be extremely strategic, cost-effective, pragmatic, and uh, leaders. Somehow, we need to be very much leaders on the solutions we will propose. And uh, clearly, the, the economic recovery is fundamental at the moment. But uh, at the same time, the recovery of our society and making sure that the investments we are making are the right one, the strategic one. If you look at the richest countries in the world, no one of them is rich because they have destroyed the environment. I mean, what they are doing now, it, it proves that you can develop economically, protecting the health of your people and without destroying the biodiversity, the environmental resources that you have available and, uh, and, and, and what is around us that we, we, we are polluting everything we touch. So for me, it, it's all win-win. 
Uh, but uh, probably the, 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 the health professionals or, or in, in economists and, and, and people working on environmental issues, we need to align our forces and provide all of these uh, strong arguments. Those countries who are investing at the moment on clean sources of energy, those who are moving very quick, quickly on a very ambitious way on, on, on moving into clean, renewable sources of energy, those are the winners. And it's, it's not an economist talking, it's, it's, a, it's a public health officer, it's a physician. But we have plenty of arguments to prove that if you do so, you will reduce the cost of the chronic diseases that at the moment, moment are populating our hospitals. You will reduce the burden on the sick people or in the, the citizens that are breathing horrible toxic air every day. And you are investing on the future, generating green jobs and what else? I think that the, the arguments are so powerful. I cannot imagine a country like India with such a knowledge and wisdom and, and, and traditions and everything not to be uh, uh, moving into this strategic uh, way and, and doing a green uh, and, and an important uh, revolution here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. We will now begin the question answer session. I will be selecting questions sent by the audience and we have a vast number of questions, but I'll just pick a few of them. Uh, any speaker from the team may answer, but you have exactly 60 seconds to do so. Uh, the first question to the team for the motion is, uh, question for the motion, question number one, if economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, what stops us from internalizing the so-called externalities. Yes. So the problem is that these external two thirds of the economy is private sector and two thirds of impacts therefore on the environment are also private sector. Unfortunately, we seem to live in a world where we accept that the mantra of private profits, public losses, private profits, public losses should be allowed to continue because it's good for the economy. That's complete rubbish. The only way we'll sort this problem out collectively and respect the environment and create that mutual respect is if we impose a regulation here in India and elsewhere in the world that all companies must measure and publish not just their profits for shareholders, but their impacts on stakeholders. And by the way, the biggest stakeholder is the future generation through the natural environment. Measurement and disclosure of externalities. The era of impact transparency is here, my friends. If we don't follow it, then we will just be forced into it at some stage. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first can I, can I just to say, oh, sorry, I was just putting adding the externalities on the health cost, five trillions cost on the, for the health system to treat all of those diseases caused by the 400 millions given by governments to subsidize fossil fuels. So those externalities, the health cost have never been included in any uh, decision making process. So please include those five trillions. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the first question against the motion, uh, John Lombard claims in his book that we are raising a false alarm on climate change. Is it the Western countries raising this alarm to stop developing countries to grow? Rose, I, I volunteer now, Rose is a great person to answer that. Is it for or against? I apologize. Actually, this question is listed against the motion, but it's actually in favor of the motion. So I'll switch over against no, the can... motion. Uh, <laughs> so if this, it's this question, what do the speakers against the motion have to say about the dilution of environmental laws by the new EA, EIA draft notification? I think the science on uh, anthropogenic emissions and um, and the science on climate change is pretty clear. I think we can all agree that the IPCC has done a formidable job in letting us know what the scenarios are and also as to how we are going to be affected with a two degree, with a three degree, and now uh, irretrievably on a four degree course. So I'm I'm not sure that this is a uh, developed versus developing debate. Unfortunately, in this context, the entire world is a developing country. And we all have to deal with you know, the realization that we all are going to be affected. I think the important part to recognize is uh, the role of incentives. And I'm gonna speak uh, 
somewhat in the tune that uh, Pavan laid out as well, which is that, look, we have to have, government has to do more, more to set out the right incentives for the right kind of action to be taken. And we're not seeing those sorts of incentives. And that's the role of government. As Kane said, government has to step in where individual people will not. And today, I think our governments are being irresponsible because they aren't doing the work that individual people can't. So as soon as we have those incentives and we are able to create the incentives for individuals as well as for countries to take the right action, we will have that. But till then, I think we are going to be irretrievably on that course and that dialectic. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jopuri. We move on to the second Chair, question. Chair, may I, may I uh, since it was a, a muddled question as to which side it was from, may I please, also please. add a, a word? I'm, I'm of course delighted to agree substantially with with Joe Puri on on this. I just want to sort of clarify one point uh, in the in the in the way the question is phrased. I don't believe Bjorn Lomborg actually says we're raising a false alarm. His point is actually a little bit more subtle and more disingenuous. He basically says that it's not clear that the cost benefit works out that we be, may be imposing high costs on societies with uncertain benefits. And what he's really and what that argument really misses is that we may that we actually have deep uncertainties about the nature of those costs that there are damage functions that are discontinuous and therefore we might see sudden changes which feeds back into the idea that the environment is not a static thing it's not like a resource it's not like a bit of tin or a bit of oil it's a set of it's an interconnected system and we don't fully understand the impacts of those systems which is why a kind of two dimensional cost benefit analysis really uh, misses the point. And on whether it's a Western country sort of alarm point, I substantially agree with Joe. I think we have to move beyond these either or politics because for India, we are a vulnerable country and a lot of things we would do to mitigate, we want to do anyway, like build cleaner, cleaner air, build better public transport and so on. Okay, uh, I move on to the second question for the motion. Uh, and that's environmental tax is an attempt to connect economy and environment. Can imposing it help in conserving nature? In general, we would argue yes, because uh, where market mechanisms have been tried, such as on the climate side, uh, the problem is, you know, there's essentially a printing of too much money. Um, the carbon credits have basically suffered from the same problem as inflation in, in the world of uh, central banking and finance. Um, taxes are clear. They apply jurisdictionally. They don't need to cut across boundaries. Um, and so long as the system, as in the economic system in the country, is able to afford them and there are tax offsets, they can be managed. And uh, therefore, we do believe that looking at taxation, whether it is uh, carbon taxation, pollution taxation, pollution taxes, or whatever other form of taxation. I mean, uh, in, in the words of... Um, in the words of a famous U.S. president, tax is what you pay for membership of a civilized society. It's the membership fee that you pay to be a member of civilized society. So we should not look at it as a negative. And generally, economists will argue that sensible taxation, progressive taxation, can actually support the economy and the distribution of incomes within the economy. Uh, the second question against the motion is very, very India-related. And... Uh, it says, what do the speakers against the motion have to say about the dilution of environmental laws by the new EIA draft notification? So the assumption there, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that the government, including uh, in some manner of speak, the strategic arm of the government, which is Niti Aayog, doesn't know what it's doing. The assumption is specious and it is, it is meant to divide. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, the uh, in, a, in a country like ours, uh, a very fine balance at a very micro level has to be established and aligned to the macro policies. And uh, by no means uh, uh, the fact that certain projects will not wait endlessly and there will be a modicum of uh, 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 you know the decision making speed in introduced into it doesn't mean that the experts who have been brought in are all uh, stooges of the government and those who will. Uh, you know, we have a robust system where the states and the center hardly agree. So clearly there will be tension. They are the courts that are available. There is a very robust media in India. So I assure the eminent uh, querist that uh, there is no uh, sellout to inherent in the environmental impact assessment dilution. It's actually simply uh, rebooting it in a manner which 
which can be more effective in delivering outcomes that we discussed for the Tadoba village, for example, uh, or the RA forest, for example, rather than endlessly letting it in a drift and be very good and get brownie points with the Western world. Uh, we are now moving on to the concluding round. Speakers, you have two minutes to conclude. Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Maria Nira. Please do begin. Difficult task, but just I would try. I mean, use your common sense. If you don't want a life, a, a world, a society with clean air, with clean water, without uh, your, uh, your hot oceans, without plastic, uh, ending in your body as well. If you don't want to use uh, fossil fuels from the, the, the <laughs> Stone Age, if you don't want to, to, to keep uh, using uh, fossil fuels and then very polluting fuels for cooking and heating and, and lightening your house, then move to that. If you think that uh, breathing toxic air, uh, drinking uh, polluted water, and uh, eating food uh, which is full of pesticides and toxics, if you think this is the option, then uh, uh, prove it and uh, convince others, because I'm not convinced at all. I think everybody will go for a non-polluted environment, which will be good for health, for economy. Don't forget that at the end of the day, who pays the price of pollution is are your lungs, your brain, and your vascular system. Over. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for concluding before time. Um, uh, Dr. Jyotsna Puri, uh, Jo Puri against the motion to conclude two minutes, please. Let me see if I can read that. Um, so I have four messages. First is aspire. The second is accept. The third is price. And the fourth is verify. So an aspire. I think we have to keep on aspiring that, yes, the economy will become a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. Unfortunately, it's not true yet because second, because the profit motive is definitely far greater and has a far greater control over our lives than we'd like it to. Second, we have to accept it. So that's my second message. Third, price. We have to start thinking about how to take away subsidies that are provided uh, to a large part of the um, benefits and the impacts uh, or the externalities that we are witnessing today and start pricing the things that we care about. Good quality air, good quality water, uh, good climate, et cetera. We have to start pricing it and remove these subsidies that we are providing. And the fourth, and this is really close to my heart because I also come from the evaluation and the evidence field, verify. Impact washing. I just wrote a fin and finished a paper on impact washing. A large number of the companies that we see out there in the global space are impact washing all of the impacts that they're talking about in the environment space. And unless we do and ask them to raise themselves to a higher standard, we're not going to win this fight. Thank you. Thank you again for concluding before time. Pavan Sukhdev, Pavan Sukhdev for the motion to conclude two minutes, please. Um, it's clearly a case of externalities being the problem. The question is, can externalities be internalized? And I say to you that today's externalities are tomorrow's risks and day after tomorrow's costs. And I say to you that that's something that every banker and every corporate CEO should understand and live with that. Secondly, I say that externalities do get internalized. It's either by default or by decree or by disaster. By default, it happens you know, uh, by design or by default, it happens with what we are suggesting. Let's get organized. Let's do the right things. Let's measure our impacts correctly and disclose them properly. That would be by design. And, and unfortunately, what tends to happen is sometimes by decree, as in when the UK government imposed a sugar levy on uh, sugar sweetened beverages, and that led to a collapse in prices of sugar companies, including Tate and Lyle, as well as the beverage manufacturers. And the third way of internalization is internalization by disaster. And that's what happened in the in 2010 with the price of British Petroleum when it, they lost market cap of about 70 billion dollars immediately after the the tragic disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. So internalization by disaster is what unfortunately we are heading towards because we don't seem to accept that the economy truly is a part of society which is a part of the environment. And that understanding and that realization really needs to spread out across the whole of humankind. If we accept that, then we are fine. Then means we will make the changes and have internalization by design. Unfortunately, 
Right now, we are heading towards internalization by disaster, and that's what we are learning with COVID-19. And indeed, unfortunately, that's what we will learn very soon when the climate increases, the temperature increases that Joe, Joe Puri has talked about happen. That will be the ultimate internalization by disaster. Let's not wait for that to happen, please. Thank you, Pawan. Uh, Priyanka Chaturvedi, your turn. Priyanka Chaturvedi, against the motion, to conclude two minutes, please. Uh, beliefs that even I hold true to my, my own civilizational values and what India stands for. Uh, a civilizational history has taught us that nature has played a very important role in terms of what we believe in and how we believe in coexistence. In fact, we have given the elements of nature the position of godliness, and that is what India stands for. India also stands for its climate change goals, despite many developed nations standing against it at this point in time. So that is our commitment to the environment. However, that commitment and the reason why I stand against this motion, and let's not forget that the reason I stand against this motion is because ownership and the feeling of ownership leads to exploitation. And that is the basic premise of why I stand against this motion. So when I speak about moving from darkness to light, let's move in such a fashion that we do not end up destroying what we already hold dear to our hearts. So this is why I would believe that while we talk about mutual respect, coexistence, we make our governments as well as corporates accountable for it and not the individuals who are leading these lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Navroj Dubash, for the motion to conclude, two minutes, please. What I take away from this, uh, from this debate is that it seems hard to refute analytically that the proposition is true, that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, but the belief systems and the institutions uh, and the um, policies aren't actually aligned with that, with that uh, statement uh, at the moment. So it's not so much true in practice. Uh, analytically, it seems very hard to refute. Now, how do we sort of square this circle? And I think a lot of, I think this is shared ground for many of us uh, on both sides of this conversation. Uh, what's interesting to me is that we really are in a kind of pause moment here with COVID. Uh, it's a pause moment at the level of us as, as I believe, most of us as individuals, I think uh, uh, as societies and governments as well. So many of the uh, participants on both sides have talked, for example, about the price mechanism and internalizing externalities. And I think that is really an important part of bridging that gap between belief systems and, and what I believe to be analytically true. Uh, but I don't think it's quite enough. Um, and we haven't seen enough of it, for example, in recovery packages uh, around the world. I think we have to be a little bit of creative about what else we look at. So yes, let's plug away at the, at the price story, but let's also look at behavior. Uh, a lot of the studies essentially say the only way to achieve 1.5 degrees at a reasonable cost is actually widespread behavioral change. Uh, that has to be part of the story. And COVID has induced all sorts of behavioral change. We're seeing work from home. We're having Zoom conversations like this. I think many of us will be traveling far less for work than we were uh, uh, just a, a few months ago. And there are other sorts of behavioral changes uh, that, we're, that we're seeing uh, as well. I think we also see opportunities for packaged change. And by that, I mean, if we take something like the power sector in India, uh, we have an opening here to shut down coal-fired power plants that have extended their useful life, that have, that have expended their useful life, rather, and do that as part of a recovery package. How do we make COVID go together with uh, recovery in ways that are systematic and thinking creatively about, about those sorts of things? The last point, uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. The last point I'll simply say is, is, is this. We also, in the COVID moment, kind of I think many of us individually and collectively are stepping back to say, what is important to us? What is important is not having a precarious life, having health, education, security, and maybe less the kind of rule that many of us implicitly carry around that those of us who have the most toys when we die wins. That's not a rule that really is consistent with the proposition that we have here. And I think we have a moment to kind of rethink some of those fundamental assumptions uh, uh, about our lives as individuals and as communities. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Navruz. Uh, Rohit Bansal, you have the absolute last word. Rohit Bansal, against the motion to conclude two minutes, please. Last word is always with the chairman, sir. But uh, to, to your, to, despite your, uh, your gracious attempt, I'm not going to fall for it. Uh, I must say that uh, Navroz uh, has, uh, has said it for us. Uh, 
I think we need to revisit some of the uh, assumptions and the assumption of the antithetical position is uh, no good. Uh, we are at a very, very important turn and cusp of history. Uh, and nature and the economy, uh, environment and the economy are, are beckoning human beings to think differently, to think innovatively and frugally. Uh, nobody can have disputes with, uh, uh, with th those arguments. And I think towards the end, uh, we might want to uh, therefore see the, 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 the messaging that is going out of this uh, uh, effort by Sanctuary to the outside world and not necessarily uh, limit ourselves to the Oxford Union collegiate uh, atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is fine, but the, uh, the, the import should be uh, left for people to think that uh, at the end, uh, if a poor person is going to uh, emerge from the pandemic a little stronger, a little more uh, sensitivity from the rich is going to be the way forward. There is no way in which uh, uh, mere talk on the environment is going to help either side. Uh, there is no either side. There is only one planet and there is clearly, clearly certain message for all of us to take home from this discussion. I was particularly enriched with what uh, 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 Maria said and uh, Pawan said on, on the whole dimension that uh, uh, the, the environment needs to be uh, brought uh, in, a, in a greater uh, force in our thought process including policy with the policy crowd, with the corporates as well, and as individuals. But uh, I would uh, submit uh, uh, for the consideration of this house and the chair that uh, we, should, we should stop thinking of one being uh, subordinate to the other because this wholly owned subsidiary business means one doesn't have the personality and the other does. A wholly owned subsidiary does not have a personality of its own. And to say that the economy doesn't have a personality of its own, that it shall reign uh, uh, in, in, a, in a subordinate status to the environment when, the, uh, when they are actually conjoined and intertwined, if not one and the same thing, is, is not necessarily a great idea to leave this wonderful evening brought together uh, uh, by, by Sanctuary and Bittu Saigal right here, punching away on his phone and, I don't know, uh, uh, hoping that, uh, that all of us fight a lot harder. Uh, thank you, Rohit. Uh, with this, we conclude, ladies and gentlemen. And I congratulate all the participants and I congratulate particularly those who spoke for the motion. But all of you have done a wonderful job and it's been really a fascinating debate. Uh, at least I've greatly enjoyed chairing this debate. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me thank uh, uh, all of you for this wonderful, uh, you know, great insights into this debate. May I now request Julia Martin Lefebvre to give us her closing remarks. Over to you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's not much to say. First of all, there wasn't too much disagreement between the two sides, simply a different way of looking at things. Uh, uh, and uh, there were some suggestions for action to increase the appreciation of the role of nature in our economic models. How are we going to change the GDP? Somebody has to continue working on that. Uh, the way we communicate. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for using the term nature-based solution. You were the first one to use it. I already put it in my concluding remarks as I was listening to you. There are solutions and what we need now, we're going to have many other pandemics and crises, floods and hurricanes and, and extreme weather changes from one day to the next. Uh, and we're going to have to learn from this. There, we must look at preventive measures rather than disconnected responses and disconnected behavior. And of course we need we should all run for government offices. We need governments to actually not just make promises, but actually move to action. And we need citizens to make sure that that happens. Thank you very much. I've also greatly enjoyed this and I wish we had more time to continue talking. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, economy and environment are all closely interlinked and these interlinkages are all embracing. Every economic action can have some if effect on the environment and every environmental change can have an impact on the economy. And so ladies and gentlemen, it's been such a wonderful and such a fascinating debate today. And I would uh, like to just thank all of you, particularly the audience. And I would like to thank uh, the sponsor of this debate, Morning Star, the partners Carbon Copy and Book My Show, and the excellent speakers for and against the motion, you, all of whom you've just heard. And ladies and gentlemen, let me thank the audience the wonderful audience who so vigorously and so energetically participated and voted in this debate. They are the true soul and life of the Sanctuary Nature Foundation.
Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. With this, we conclude this debate. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.